The sermon text this morning is Leviticus 24 and 25. I'll be reading Leviticus 24 and then the first 19 verses of chapter 25. I encourage you to read it in its entirety uh, as you have opportunity. These are the words of God. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Command the children of Israel that they bring unto thee pure oil, olive beaten for the light, to cause the lamps to burn continually. Outside the veil of the testimony in the tabernacle of the congregation shall Aaron order it from the evening unto the morning for the Lord continually. It shall be a statute forever in your generations. He shall order the lamps upon the pure candlestick before the Lord continually. And thou shalt take fine flour and bake twelve cakes thereof. Two tenth deals shall be in one cake. And thou shalt set them in two rows, six on a row, upon the pure table before the Lord. And thou shalt put pure frankincense upon each row, that it may be on the bread for a memorial, even an offering made by fire unto the Lord. Every Sabbath he shall set it in order before the Lord continually, being taken from the children of Israel by an everlasting covenant. And it shall be Aaron's and his sons, and they shall eat it in the holy place, for it is most holy unto him of the offerings of the Lord, made by fire, by a perpetual statute. And the son of an Israelitish woman whose father was an Egyptian, went out among the children of Israel. And this son of the Israelitish woman and a man of Israel strove together in the camp. And the Israelitish woman's son blasphemed the name of the Lord and cursed. And so they brought him unto Moses, and his mother's name was Shelemeth, the daughter of Dibri of the tribe of Dan. And they put him in ward, that the mind of the Lord might be showed them. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Bring forth him that cursed without the camp. And let all that heard him lay their hands on his head, and let all the congregation stone him. And thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel, saying, Whosoever curseth his God shall bear his sin. And he that blasphemeth the name of the Lord, he shall surely be put to death. And all the congregation shall certainly stone him, as well as the stranger, as he that is born in the land, when he blasphemeth the name of the Lord, he shall be put to death. And he that killeth any man shall surely be put to death. And he that killeth a beast shall make it good, beast for beast. And if a man cause a blemish in his neighbor, as he hath done, so shall it be done to him. Breach for breach, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. As he hath caused a blemish in a man, so shall it be done to him again. And he that killeth a beast, he shall restore it. And he that killeth a man, he shall be put to death. He shall have one manner of law, as well for the stranger as for your own country. For I am the Lord your God. And Moses spake unto the children of Israel that they should bring forth him that had cursed outside the camp and stone him with stones. And so the children of Israel did as the Lord commanded Moses. And the Lord spake unto Moses in Mount Sinai, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, When you come into the land which I give you, then shall the land keep a Sabbath unto the Lord. Six years thou shalt sow thy field, and six years thou shalt prune thy vineyard, and gather in the fruit thereof. But in the seventh year shall be a Sabbath of rest unto the land, a Sabbath for the Lord. Thou shalt neither sow thy field, nor prune thy vineyard. That which groweth of its own accord of thy harvest thou shalt not reap, neither gather the grapes of thy vine undressed, for it's a year of rest unto the land. And the Sabbath of the land shall be meat for you, for thee, and for thy servant, and for thy mate, and for thy hired servant, and for the stranger that sojourneth with thee. And for thy cattle, and for the beasts that are in thy land, shall all the increase thereof be meat. And thou shalt number seven Sabbaths of years unto thee, seven times seven years. And the space of the seven Sabbaths of years shall be unto thee forty and nine years. Then shalt thou cause the trumpet of the jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month in the day of atonement. And shall ye make the trumpet sound throughout all your land. And ye shall hallow the fiftieth year, and proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. It shall be a jubilee unto you, and you shall return every man unto his possession, and you shall return every man unto his family. A jubilee shall that fiftieth year be unto you. You shall not sow, neither reap that which groweth of itself in it, nor gather the grapes in it of thy vine undressed. For it is the jubilee. It shall be holy unto you. You shall eat the increase thereof out of the field. And in the year of this jubilee, you shall return every man unto his possession. And if thou sell aught unto thy neighbor, or buyest aught of thy neighbor's hand, you shall not oppress one another. According to the number of years after the jubilee, thou shalt buy of thy neighbor, and according unto the number of years of the fruits, he shall sell unto thee. According to the multitude of years, thou shalt increase the price, and according to the fewness of years, thou shalt diminish the price. For according to the number of years of the fruits, doth he sell unto thee. You shall not therefore oppress one another, but thou shalt fear thy God, for I am the Lord your God. 
Wherefore, you shall do my statutes and keep my judgments and do them. And you shall dwell in the land in safety. And the land shall yield her fruit. And you shall eat your fill and dwell therein in safety. Our God and Father, we thank you for these good words that your spirit inspired for our good. Father, we ask you to drive them into our hearts so that we might honor you like we ought and honor your word like we ought. And so we might be able to love you and love our neighbor as we ought. We ask for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So part of the advantage of taking larger sections of Scripture together is seeing how seemingly different pieces actually all fit together. Now, we know the whole Scripture is this way. Genesis to Revelation is one great uh, mosaic. It's one great piece, and it all goes together. But when we look at sections like this, uh, there's some really neat things that are, are uh, revealed to us. So, for example... Here we have a passage that begins with worship. So at the very beginning of 24, you have the instructions for the oil of the lamps in the holy place and the bread in the holy place. Lamps and bread, light and bread in the holy place. The text begins with worship. And then you have the instance, the episode of the, of the guy who strives with the other Israelite. They get into a fight in the middle of the fight. He blasphemes the name of the Lord and you've got this criminal trial that breaks out in Israel, and a review of the principles of justice. And then as you go right into chapter 25, we have uh, God's instructions basically for the Israelite economic structure. So the, the Sabbath cycles and the years of Jubilee essentially create the overarching economic policy for Israel. So we went from worship to criminal justice to economic policies. The overarching point is that justice and economics are always thoroughly theological matters. The overarching point is that justice and economics are always thoroughly theological matters. We are always appealing to God or some God. Whenever we adjudicate crimes, buy or sell, lease or forgive. There's always a standard, there's always a center, there's always a holy place. There's always a God. There is always an ultimate standard. It is never whether, always which. Okay, it's never whether there will be a God. It's never whether there will be a holy place. The question is, which holy place is it at the center? Which God is it at the center? There's always a standard. It's not whether, but which. So let's walk through this uh, these two chapters, section by section, together. At the beginning, God reminds his people that the covenant with him is their light and life. Okay, that's what he's reminding of them of. This covenant with me is your light and life. And so they were to picture that continually with candles and bread in the holy place. Light and life, continually. You have no light and you have no life apart from me. That's chapter 24, 1 to 9. Now, because God's covenant is the source of all light and life, his law prohibits blasphemy. And, and the two actually go together. Uh, and depending on its severity, blasphemy then can, re, can be a capital crime because it's an attack on life itself. So that's the second half of chapter 24, verses 10 to 23. Again, if God is the source of life, and Israelite life is utterly dependent on God for it, uh, certain forms of hatred, sustained attack on that life amounts to what? Murder, right? It's taking life. It's seeking to take life, and so it amounts to that. Related to this principle was the requirement of Sabbath years where fields were left fallow, culminating in the 50th year of Jubilee. That's in chapter 25, verses 1 to 12. So every seventh year was a Sabbath year. They were to leave the, the fields fallow. And then after seven of those sevens, they would have a 50th year Jubilee. In the year of Jubilee, rural lands and houses were returned to their original owners, which created basically a 50-year lease-rent cycle. 
So this is an overarching, basically, organization to rural lands and houses. Everything, basically, um, was, re uh, was leased or rented based on how many years you were away from the Jubilee. So if, it, if the Jubilee had just happened and you had 47 years left in, in that period of time, then the rent was set at a certain rate and the lease was set at a certain rate. But if it was only two years until the Jubilee, the rent lease was set at a different rate. This basically sets up a, a core element of the Israelite economy. The only exceptions were those houses uh, and lands that the Levites were given or those cities which are those houses that were built in cities. You see this in chapter 25, verses 13 to 17, and then verses 29 to 34. God promised that obedience to these laws would cause the land to be blessed and that Israel would dwell in safety. That's verses 18 to 22. And again, this is connected to God being light and life. You have no light apart from me. You have no life apart from me. And so there's this, so this is what I want you to do. You're going to organize your harvests. You're going to organize your economy. You're going to organize your use of land according to these cycles, according to my word. And of course, the question is, is do you trust me? You say, well, if we don't plant and harvest in that seventh year, what are we going to eat? And then you want us to do it twice after 50 years, two years in a row, 49 and 50? And God says, am I your life? Will I provide for you? Where does your prosperity come from? Where does your safety come from? Does it come from me or does it come from you? Does it come from your brilliance, your wisdom, your technology, your medical science, your priests? Where does it come from? Or does it come from me? And so this is all connected. These these Sabbath years and these Jubilee years, these laws are God saying, who do you trust? Where does your life come from? Where is your safety found? Is it in me or is it in you? Is it in your wisdom? These Jubilee Sabbath years, every 50th year, also included the forgiveness of debts and the release of debt slaves. The forgiveness of debts and the release of debt slaves. We see that in 25 to 28, in chapter 25 and then in chapter 25, 35 to 46. And then the chapter ends, chapter 25 ends, emphasizing that debt slaves could always be redeemed by their close relatives. Debt slaves always had the option. They had to be freed in the 50th year, but prior to that, their close relatives were always, always had the option to pay their debts and set them free. They always had the option to redeem them. So Jesus said, that he is the light of the world, John 8, 12. Jesus also said, he's the bread of life, John 6, 48. The light and the bread in the holy place are pointing to Jesus. The light and the bread in the holy place are pointing to Jesus. Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. I am the bread of life. In him is life, and his life is the light of men, John 1, verse 4. But I say that, and you say, yeah, that's that's." That's good religious talk, Pastor. Good job. Jesus is the light of the world. Yay, yay, Jesus. And, and yes, that's, it's true, but what you're tempted to do is think, oh, uh, yes, he's talking about religious and spiritual things again. Good for him, right? No, Jesus is the light of the world, not just on Sunday morning, not just when you open your Bible and have quiet time, not just when you have family worship, not when you just have PDG or choir or small group or some other Bible study. No, Jesus is the light of the world everywhere, all the time. Jesus is the light that allows us to see everything in this world accurately and clearly, all the time. Everything, it applies to everything. He is the light of the world. It's not merely a spiritual or religious fact. Of course, he is the way to the Father. Yes, he shows us that way too, and that is a spiritual, not earthly thing to the Father. Yes, but remember, Jesus made all things. Jesus made all things, and therefore, he knows all things. This applies to all things. His light and life show the way to the Father, and that fellowship, though, that we have with the Father, John in 1 John says, is for the light of the world. It's to light up the world so that we can walk in the light as he is in the light. So his light and his life are for criminal justice, economic policies, finances, debt, planting, harvest, science, 
restitution, redemption, health care, education, safety, and blessing. Right? Everything. His light and his life apply to everything. This is a simple but radical fact. You cannot have long-term progress and success apart from Jesus. That's, that's the point. You cannot have success in your business. You cannot have success in economics. You cannot have success in the public square, in justice. You can't have success in any of these areas apart from Jesus. It was the light of Christ that built Western civilization. It was the light of Christ that built Western civilization. It was the light of Christ that gave the Reformation. It was the light of Christ. They saw Christ, and then they saw the darkness, and it was clear. It was the light of Christ that gave true creativity and enlightenment during the Renaissance and Age of Exploration. It's the light of Christ that gave us political freedom, economic prosperity, medical progress, and measures of justice and stability never before seen in the history of the world. We were just having a pleasant conversation last night at dinner about modern medicine and how they used to do amputations. Yeah. Don't you talk about this at dinner? And you, aren't you glad for modern medicine? This is how they used to do amputations. Ah. Right? And you ought to say, thank you, Jesus. Okay? But this And what has been going around, though, for the last 500 years, well, and, and longer, but what's, what's the, the drum that's been beat again and again is what happened was, the, the false narrative is, there were people that were captured, they were, they were under the spell of superstition for a thousand years in the Dark Ages. And then they threw off religion and God and they used reason and they looked around and then they figured out that math works and science works and they invented modern medicine without God, right? That, that's the message that you're, you're getting. That's the message over and over again is, Religion causes superstition. Religion causes wars. Religion causes fighting. You can do a little religion on the side if you want to. But really, if you want to make any progress, you have to use reason and common sense. Right? That's the claim. First of all, that's not what happened. That isn't what happened in the Reformation. That's not what happened in the Renaissance. That's not what happened in the Age of Exploration. That's not what founded our country at all. It was people who believed in Jesus, who said, Jesus is our light and our life, and there's no other. We're going to do whatever his word says. They're the ones that drove it. Now, all along the way, there were scoundrels, right? It's not like everybody was a Christian. Of course not. There were piles of people who thought they were doing it in their own strength. There were piles of people who said, I don't believe in God. I only believe in science, right? And they were wrong, right? They were wrong, right? God created that science. God created this world. God was the one at work in it all, but the thing that drove it overwhelmingly was Christ. That's the thing. Christ drove it. That's where it all came from. But as men and women reject Christ and reject his light and his word, darkness inevitably closes in. Okay? Follow this closely. You can't turn off the lights and it stay light. If you turn the lights off, it gets dark. If you say, we're going to close the shades, we're, don't, we're, not going, we're going to cover the light, you can't even say, why did it get so dark in here? You just turned the lights off. You just extinguished the candle. You just turned it off. There, the, the light of the world is Christ. The light of the world is the living God. There's no other light. And so as we reject it as a civilization, as we've rejected it as a culture, inevitably with it comes all the confusions and chaos of darkness, violence, regression of every, of every kind. This sustained rejection of Christ and his light is what we call blasphemy. That's blasphemy. A sustained hatred and rejection of Christ and his light is what we call blasphemy. The oil lights in the holy place were pointing forward to the giving of the Holy Spirit. Children, I have a question for you. I don't always do this, but this is also to make sure you're still paying attention. Children, when God gave the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, what did it look like? Do you remember? At Pentecost, the Spirit came down, it sounded like a rushing wind, and they saw what? Tongues of fire. Remember? Little flames over top the heads of all those people which means they all looked like little human candles. 
right? That's what you'd, you'd look at. You're like, look, there's a flame over it. You're like a, you're like a candlestick, right? That's what it looked like. They looked like candles, okay? The candles in the holy place were prefiguring the spirit coming, right? That, that's all it was. God says, I'm your light, and the spirit's going to be given one day, and I'm going to light up this world. Christ is going to come. The light is going to come, die, rise again, ascend into heaven, and then the light's going to be poured out in people. I'm going to light up your lives. Now remember, remember what Jesus said. Jesus said, all sins will be forgiven except blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't, I don't think that Jesus or this passage is talking about some random curse. I don't think this is casually taking the Lord's name in vain. This is, this is not that at all. What Jesus was talking about in the first century was, look, you, you saw a whole, you know, 33 years, three years intensive of me, and you've rejected that, fine, but I'm going to die, rise again, send the Spirit, and it's going to be poured out into the whole church, and there's a ticking clock. And basically, you need to see this is God, and you need to repent. But if you keep rejecting God, you've had, you know, sort of strike one, me. Strike two is the Spirit. And if you reject that, well, you don't get a strike three. You're done. Okay? That, that's what he's saying. That's what he's saying. He's talking about intense, hard-hearted, persistent rejection of the light. We noted previously in Leviticus that murder is the one mandatory capital crime in the Bible. Murder is the one mandatory capital crime in the Bible. But the uh, death penalty is also a maximum penalty for a number of other crimes. And that principle is actually underlined here. If you, if you ever want a, a text to go to and say, how would I demonstrate that capital punishment is only mandatory for murder, but it's, it's an optional maximum sentence for other crimes? This is actually a great text. Because here, the people needed to inquire of the Lord to see what the appropriate penalty would be for the blasphemy, as in verse 12. If the death penalty were mandatory, there would have been no need to inquire of the Lord or put him in jail. Why, why did they have to inquire of the Lord? Because it, it was a, there's a maximum penalty. It wasn't an it wasn't a, it wasn't a automatic penalty. Also, right after the, the, the text is given, it reviews the principles. And it, again, twice in our text says, if somebody kills another man, they are to be put to death. Now, if somebody kills an animal, they have to replace the animal. Blemish for blemish, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. That, that's the principle of biblical justice is basic restitution. But at the top of the list is life for life. So that's repeated here. So this demonstrates the death penalty was not mandatory for blasphemy, but it was a possible maximum sentence. The following verses reinforce basic biblical justice, the lex talionis, eye for eye, principles of restitution, which incidentally prohibit all personal vengeance and are applied equally to everyone. That's in verses 17 to 21. By the way, many Christians misunderstand the words of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount when he appeals to this. He says, you have heard it said, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, but I say to you, you shall love your enemies and do good to those who persecute you. What Jesus is there condemning is all personal vengeance. What he's condemning there is using that principle and then hitting your brother over the head with it, taking matters into your own hands. No, you're supposed to leave vengeance to the Lord. He repays, right? And Paul says this in Romans 12. At the very end of Romans 12, he says, as far as you're concerned, if your enemy is hungry, give him something to eat. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. Heap burning coals on his head, but leave vengeance to the Lord. Now, don't stop reading. Chapter 13 comes right after chapter 12. And he says, the minister of God's vengeance is the civil magistrate. Ah, call the cops. <laughs> that's what Paul is saying. You do not get to take the law in your own hands, and that's what Jesus is insisting on in the Sermon on the Mount. Personal vengeance is completely forbidden. However, judges and civil magistrates are required to judge justly. And the standard that we have in Scripture is Basic equity, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, breach for breach, that's justice. So given all this and given the context we're given here in Leviticus 24, between the blasphemy and the physical altercation that happened, so this guy that um, we're told about, that he gets into a tussle, some kind of fight, there's some kind of assault that takes place, and in the course of the assault, blasphemes the Lord. 
So putting that all together, this crime amounted to murder. Because that's what it takes to get the death penalty. This crime amounted to murder. It was not just a casual taking of the Lord's name in vain. It was high-handed covenant treason, a murderous assault on God and his people. That's what it was. It was a murderous assault on God and his people, and therefore that particular form of blasphemy was rightly punished with the death penalty. And, by the way, we're seeing the results of not learning this lesson all around us. We're seeing the results of not learning this lesson all around us. You cannot have life, liberty, or justice for all apart from honoring the triune God who is their source. There is a kind of sustained hatred of the living God that amounts to a murderous hatred of all liberty and justice. And you can't, you can't just say, well, they're just saying that. No, he attacked somebody, there was a violent assault, and there was blasphemy. You cannot have life, liberty, and justice for all based on pure democracy. You cannot have life, liberty, and justice for all based on the goodness of man, or pure reason, or some vague deity in the sky. No, life, liberty, and justice are from God the Father, the creator of heaven and earth, and his only son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. If you honor his name and you honor his laws, then you may have light and life. If you honor the source of all light and life, then you can have it. He will give it. But if you do not honor him, and if you are determined to dishonor him and his name, then you are on the path to destroying life, liberty, and justice. It's worth pointing out that blasphemy laws are inescapable. You might be tempted to say, oh yeah, that was the Old Testament when they had blasphemy laws. No, there are always blasphemy laws. There are always blasphemy laws. Every culture has them. We call them hate speech codes. Hate speech, right? Words that you can say or write that will get you fined and possibly thrown into jail. Those are blasphemy codes. Everybody has them. Every culture has them. The The only question is, what are we protecting? What are we honoring? It's which God will be honored and which God are you allowed to mock? And Western civilization right now has determined to blaspheme the living God and made it illegal to blaspheme various priestly peoples. Now, when people are in the process of rejecting God and rejecting his word, they are often doing so because they claim his standards make them feel bad. People frequently say that, uh, they don't want to believe in God. They don't want to believe in, his, in, in Christianity. They don't believe in that religious stuff because it makes them feel bad. God's law condemns our sin, and so it makes those who refuse to repudiate their sin feel bad. So if you're determined to hold on to your sin and God says, that's bad, then you, then you say, but that makes me feel bad. Now, the right answer is, so let go of your sin. Right? Let go of your sin and come into the light. But people who are refusing to let go of their sin say, no, I'm getting away from God. So they think they're they're gonna try to get away from God. But here's the thing. When men reject the living God and his word, the sin doesn't actually go away. You you ran out of the room and told on to your sin, but you're still holding on to your sin. You still have sin in your life. And so they can't can't just go along and pretend uh, everything's fine. And so what they do is they frequently try to rename their sin or they invent new false gospels to pretend to deal with it. Since they've rejected God, they still got the sin problem, and so they rename it, they reclassify it, or else they try to invent a new false gospel to deal with it. So one example of this, one way people deal with their bad feelings about sin uh, was invented, or at least popularized, uh, by a real uh, special man named Sigmund Freud. Sigmund Freud, father of kind of modern psychobabble, taught that since sexual sin makes people feel guilty and ashamed, people should be allowed to do whatever they want to do sexually so they don't feel so bad because if they feel bad, they might do bad things. You see that? So that was the logic of Freud. Freud basically said people have these sexual urges rather than repressing them, rather than saying that's wrong, you shouldn't do that, and making them feel bad, you should encourage them to express themselves freely because then they won't feel bad, and then after they kind of get it out of their system, they'll, they'll, they'll become normal human beings. Right? And ta-da, here we are in 2022. <laughs> it didn't work. 
No, it turns out that you don't, you don't normalize, you just get worse and worse. You go into the sewer and it gets worse and worse. And but that, that's what Freud said. Freud said, if you don't make them feel so bad, they won't go around doing bad things. Secular statists believe that people commit crimes because they are poor or don't have equal opportunities. This is, this is the, the explanation of sin from secular statists. The reason why people do bad things is because you didn't, they don't have enough money and they're sad and they don't have as many opportunities as other people, and so they're upset about that, they're angry, and so then they go out and they commit crimes. They do bad things. So the state, these secular statists urge, must provide universal basic income in, uh, and enforce equal opportunities for everyone, including things like abortions, daycare, parental leave, social security, Medicaid, universal income, all these things, reparations. And notice what they do. Notice that they will call this justice. Justice for the poor. Healthcare justice. Economic justice. But notice the reasoning. Notice the reasoning here. People do bad things if you don't give them what they demand. Therefore, if you don't give them what they demand, you're effectively making them do bad things. You see that? That's, now, in the old days, we used to call that a hostage situation. <laughs> Right? If, if you don't give me what I'm demanding, I will do bad things. And everybody says, you better give it to them. They need money, give it to them. Give it, give it to them. They need health care, give it to them. They want a new job, give it to them. If you don't give it to them, they'll feel bad and they'll do bad things. Right? And if you don't give it to them, then your part, you're not doing justice. It's a complete inversion of the notion of justice. The demands of people are not divine. Their lusts are not divine. Their demands are not divine. There's only one God. His will is good and perfect. Justice is paying back what you have put wrong in his world. This is his world, and therefore justice is according to his rules. Freedom is not doing whatever you want. Freedom is the ability to live in God's world according to its design. Freedom is not the ability to do whatever you want. Freedom is the ability to live in God's world according to its design. Freedom is freedom from the curse of sin and freedom to love God and your neighbor with everything that you are. That's freedom. And in Christian freedom, there is prosperity and safety. But trying to keep up with every lust or demand of everyone around you is actually slavery. If, you, if your job is to scramble around and give everyone what they're demanding for, you're a slave. That's not freedom. That's not freedom at all. The other way secularists often try to deal with their sin is by voting to legalize it or rename it. This is the other way that statists frequently try to deal with their sin, by voting to legalize or rename their sin or their crimes to try to make everyone feel better. So they vote to legalize theft by taxation. They vote to legalize theft by imminent domain. They vote to legalize murder by abortion. They vote to legalize gay mirage or whatever. But the problem with all this is it doesn't work. You can vote, you can vote, um, you know, uh, gravity doesn't apply today. Who cares? Right? We've decided, we took a vote, it was you know, 275 to 115 in the house, water's no longer wet. Right? What? You did nothing. You did nothing of the sort. You can try to redefine everything and anything you want to do, but if it's in God's word, if it's part of God's world, you didn't do anything. You didn't do anything. It doesn't actually work. These offers of forgiveness, these offers of grace are fake. Giving in to sin or approving of sin or trying to legalize it never actually deals with it. And so the secular materialist and the statist gospels are false and empty. There is no forgiveness of sins without the shedding of blood. There's no forgiveness of sins without the shedding of blood. But it must be the blood of a perfectly pleasing sacrifice. It must be the blood of a perfectly pleasing sacrifice. And, and notice, of course, that even as in desperation... As, as humanists and secularists and materialists are trying desperately to deal with sin on their, in their own way, they've involved blood too. But it's not working. The blood of babies doesn't take away sin. 
The blood of broken families doesn't take away sin. The blood of other victims can't take away this sin. Only Christ can take away the sin. So government programs are not real grace. Democracy, that's not the grace, okay? But it is true, it is true that real grace deals with real sin in the real world and it affects everything from public policy to taxation to inheritance laws and restitution, okay? Don't, don't miss that, right? We, they, they say it's, it's real grace deals with real sin and that flows out into the public square. It affects everything. Real grace, though, is based on real justice. And that means there's a real standard that is fixed and is based on the eternal character of God. God is all goodness, all beauty, all truth, all glory, right? Our sins are a tax on that goodness, and justice says that the wages of sin is death. But God's grace is found in his gift of life through Jesus Christ, his son. Jesus stood in the place of filthy sinners, took the penalty we deserve, died the death we owe, and rose up from the dead to set sinners free. All of this ties in to chapter 25 in the Sabbath years and the Jubilee years. Jesus came proclaiming the year of Jubilee. Jesus came proclaiming the acceptable year of the Lord, the great Jubilee. He says this explicitly in Luke 4, 18 and 19. That was his first sermon, the first sermon he gave. Back in his hometown, he reads the text from Isaiah and says, today this is accomplished in your midst. He came doing this, proclaiming the year of Jubilee, centrally through proclaiming the forgiveness of sins, right? And, and of course, this is one of the things that caused so much consternation as Jesus was going through the cities and the gospels, is that he keeps claiming to forgive sins. Remember the story of the, the lame man and his friend's put him on a, they're trying to get him to see Jesus and there's this massive crowd and they can't get in to see him, right? And, and so they put him on this, this little carrying couch thing and they, and they go up to the roof and they clear the roof away, those flat roofs back in the day, they, they make an opening, they let him down through the roof, he gets all the way down right in front of Jesus, Jesus sees him and, then, and Jesus sees them, sees the faith of his friends and says, man, your sins are forgiven. And if you were those guys that had just done all that work to bring him back to earth, what are you thinking? You're like, ah, <laughs> we want to fix him, <laughs> right? No, 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 he's lame in his feet, right? And Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. And you might, like for a moment there, you might have, there, there might have been this huge letdown, like, oh man, all that. I mean, forgiveness, that's great too. But what happens? What happens? Well, of course, a controversy breaks out because the Jews are there and, and, and they're saying, and they're, they're offended by the fact that he claims to be able to forgive sins. And so he says, fine, so that you may know that the Son of Man has power to forgive sins, get up and walk. And so he gets up and walks. Now, notice the order. Notice the order, right? Jesus came proclaiming the forgiveness of sins. Why? In order to put people's lives back together. And this is the difference between the real gospel and what is sometimes called the social gospel. All right, a social gospel, there's, there's Christians out there who say, well, we don't really like to talk about, you know, the cross and the resurrection. That's fine and everything. But what we believe Jesus came, gave, you know, came to do is, you know, help people's broken lives. Well, but as soon as you got rid of the Jesus, as soon as you got rid of the forgiveness, you're not helping anymore. Right? You're, you're, not, you're not. Now, you might, you know, rearrange things in a nice way and... And, and maybe, you know, put off some of the, the consequences of it. But notice, notice, the, the, notice the order. Jesus came declaring the forgiveness of sins. Why? In order to put people's lives back together. And there are some really, I don't know, pietistic Christians or spiritual Christians who think, well, all I care about is the gospel and I don't care about racial injustice. I don't care about politics. I don't care about economics. I don't care about anything. All I know is Jesus died for my sins and I'm going to heaven when I die. All right, well, praise God for that. But Jesus didn't just come to do that. He came to put everything back together. He came to heal the world. He came to save the world and everything in it, right? And so this is why Jesus came, proclaiming the forgiveness of sins that he was about to accomplish in the cross. This wasn't because he didn't care about poverty or crime or economic injustice, or all kinds of things that were wrong in the world, but rather because he knew that sin and guilt is the root cause of it all. Sin and guilt is the root cause of all the mess. 
Remember also that the seventh month was where the seventh year always began. Okay, the seventh year, they, they, the Sabbath year, they would kick it off in the seventh month. And what happened in the seventh month? It was the Day of Atonement. This is a quiz for those of you who were last, here last week, right? We did, the, we did Leviticus 23 last week. The Day of Atonement is in the seventh month. At the beginning of the month, they would blow the trumpet. This is the big one. This is the big one. They would blow the trumpet. And then on the 10th day was the Day of Atonement. Well, they took the blood into the presence and they confessed the sins over the scapegoat and sent the sins into the wilderness. And then every seven years, God says, I want you to have a year and I want you to jump up and down. It's the seven. It's, it's when I come and I put everything right. It's when I come and heal everything. And so this seventh year and the seven of the seven years, the Jubilees, were all echoes of that. They're all echoes of the Day of Atonement along with their trumpets. It's like God was trying to say something. Blow the trumpet in all the lands, just like you do every seventh month. All liberty and justice flow from the great atonement in the blood of Christ. All liberty and justice flow from the great atonement in the blood of Christ. What Israel's calendar pictured in the seventh months and the seventh years and the seventh seven of years in the 50th year was the great atonement, the great exodus, the great release, the great forgiveness. That's what it was proclaiming. God's going to come and heal the whole thing, right? Blood's going to be shed, and now even your land is going to be healed. He's going to put everything back together. This freedom and justice begin at the cross by restoring fellowship between God and man, access to the light and life of God. You want light? You want life. You have to have fellowship with God. You have to have fellowship in his presence, where his light continually burns, where his bread is always there for our life. And then it flows into the world. This is also why Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. We're going to pray that in just a minute. We're going to sing that as a prayer in just a minute. Maybe you remember the other translation. Maybe you grew up in a church like I did where we used to say, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And both translations are, are good, but some, maybe dead is a good one to meditate on. Here, this is a prayer for Jubilee. It's a prayer for Jubilee. God, would you forgive my debts as I release everyone around me from the debts they owe me? It's a prayer for Jubilee. Or Jesus taught the same thing when his disciples came to him and said, when our brother sins against us, how many times do we have to forgive him? How about seven times? What does Jesus say? No, 70 times seven. 70 times seven. That's a jubilee forgiveness. That's forgiveness of jubilee. God required Israel to have these automatic restarts in their calendar because he knew our hearts. We are the kind of people who hold grudges. And perhaps the hardest grudges to let go of are the ones where we have actually been wronged. Those are the hardest. The ones where we are actually right. And they're actually wrong. And then you might turn it around over and over in your heart and in your mind. And, 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 you, and you think, you, you know, you're, you read Jim Wilson's pamphlet, so you know how to be free from bitterness. And you're not, you know, you're like, I'm not raging, I'm not angry, I'm just, I'm just remembering how wrong it was. It was really wrong. And it hurt a lot. And I'm, I'm not angry. There's no smoke. I didn't lit anything on fire. I'm not throwing anything. But it's just, it was really wrong. Very wrong. And I was very right, and I, I wasn't wrong at all. And you just, you turn it around. And, and, then, and then very, and, and, and many times, even when you're trying to be as objective and, and, and good and Christian about it all, you, you, just, you know, all I want is for them to admit it. I just want them to admit that it was wrong. If they just said, yeah, I know that was wrong, I'd be fine. I just want them to acknowledge it. And maybe if they're still doing it, like just, just, just stop. You know, just recognize that you're doing it and just, just stop doing it. But if you think about it, that means that we believe they owe us something. I just want them to say it. I just want them to acknowledge it. We believe they owe us something. They, we believe they haven't paid a debt they owe us. And, then, and of course, the closer the relationship, the more we feel this because love is a debt. The apostle actually says, oh, no one except for the debt of love, 
right? Especially when it's someone close to you, when it's a, your parent, your dad, your mom, or one of your children, or your brother, or your sister, or a spouse, someone you're close to, your friend, when they betray that love, you naturally feel it. It hurts. Maybe it's something huge, maybe something big, or maybe it's just a continual dripping, a slow but steady thoughtlessness, or something that just comes around, you know, every time you have a family gathering or family reunion or someone comes into town and, oh, there it is again. And we just want them to stop and put it back. Or if they can't put it back, we just want them to just stop, just acknowledge it, or, or, or just pay back the equivalent. Just start doing what's right. Just, just, just don't make it hurt anymore. And sometimes they don't. Sometimes they don't know how. Sometimes they don't think they've done anything wrong. Sometimes they don't want to. And there it is, as plain as day to you, that they should stop doing that thing. And sometimes they don't. Sometimes they just keep running up the debt. And you think to yourself, well, I'll just, I'm just going to keep loving. I'm just going to keep paying out the love. I'm going to keep loving them. And you need to be very careful. Here, God required Israel every seven years to have an automatic restart, an automatic cancellation of all the debts. But here's the thing. The bar is not lower in the new covenant. The bar is not lower. It's not like you can say, okay, well, they offended me five years ago. I got two more years. No, the bar is higher in the new covenant. Jesus says to forgive your brother 70 times seven on the same day. Every time he asks. That's his jubilee. Let it go. Let it go. Stop. Drop it. It's gone. He said, but what if they don't ask? They haven't asked. I would. I would forgive if they asked, but they haven't asked. So I'm just... Keep just remember, you know, I mean, I'm not mad about it. I'm not bitter. But I'm just, I just know that they need to ask. <laughs> but you've got that debt. What are you doing? You're holding on to the debt. You have to let go of the debt. You have to let it go. So if they haven't asked, they don't think they're, they did anything wrong, then you sign the paperwork to release them. Sign it. Get a cashier check. <laughs> right? Write the check, and it's a cashier check. It's already been taken out of your account and then staple it to the doorpost. It's right there for them. When they come, it's there. It's already been taken out of your account. They owe you nothing. They owe you nothing. Yes, it's not fully reconciled. Sure, okay. But what you have for them is the debt paid. You have the papers of release already signed. It's already signed. It's right there by the door waiting for them. Your job is to have the forgiveness ready for them. It means, it doesn't mean that you don't think anything's wrong. It means that you see that something is wrong and you're eager to do everything in your power to make it right. So you've written the check, you've signed the paperwork, and it's waiting right there by the door. There are no outstanding debts with you. You've let it go. You released it because Jesus said to. Imagine if the prodigal son had not only spent all his father's inheritance as he did in riotous living, but had also managed to run up every major credit card he could get his hands on in all the counties. We know the heart of the father because of what he did in the parable. Remember? He saw his son when he was still a long way off. He saw his son when he was still a long way off, and he ran. He ran to meet him. He had forgiveness ready for him. He'd already written the check to pay all the debts. And that's how we have been loved. That's how we have been loved. While we were still enemies, Christ died for us. While we were still in our sins, Christ died for us. God was paying our debts while we were still running them up. (laughs) Do you see that? He paid the debts when we were running them up. We didn't care. And as Christians, we of all people ought to know that it didn't stop there. You came to Christ, you acknowledged your sins, and you were forgiven for all of it, and then the next day, you sinned again. Right? You haven't stopped sinning. You didn't stop overnight. And so you've sinned again many more times, and what have you done? 
Every time, if you know the Father, you come back to the Father again and again, and you have found the same Father waiting for you, rejoicing over you, ready to forgive, over and over, 70 times 7, jubilee of jubilees. <laughs> you're released. You're forgiven. He already signed the papers. It's finished. Right? That's what Jesus was proclaiming. It's finished. It's jubilee. The year of release. Your sins are forgiven. They're gone. They're removed from you from the east as far as the east is from the west. Remember that forgiveness is not a pro, it's not a it's not a feeling. It's a promise. Forgiveness is a promise, not a feeling. If you say that you will forgive as soon as you feel forgiveness, as soon as you're ready to forgive, that is a great way to grow bitter and never feel ready. Forgiveness, remember, is not ultimately up to you. Forgiveness comes from the Father. Strictly speaking, we do not release people from their sins. Strictly speaking, we are merely acknowledging and agreeing with God that he has released them from their sins. Right? We are promising to continue to agree with God. We can't hold the sins against them because God has paid for it. Right? Since Christ died for their sins, we can't continue sending them bills for the debt. Right? It's got paid for. You can't send them bills. Christ paid their debt and yours, and forgiveness is simply promising not to bring those debts back out to hold against them ever again. So do you want liberty and justice in the public square? Then practice it in your heart. Do you want it in the public square? Then practice it in your home, with your family, in the church, in our city, at work. And remember that the foundation of all liberty and justice is forgiveness and release. Forgive as you have been forgiven. And then even when they haven't asked for your forgiveness, have it ready for them, waiting by the door. The check signed. The release signed. And there it is, ready for them. No debts with you. Because Jesus declared the jubilee. At the end of Leviticus 25, it underlines the fact that a near relative can redeem another relative who's been sold into debt slavery. That word for a near relative is kinsman redeemer. You know the most famous kinsman redeemer was Boaz. He was the one who married the widow Ruth and, pro and provided for her and her widowed mother-in-law Naomi. Jesus is our great kinsman redeemer. He became a man so that he could be related to us. You know that? He became a man so that he could be related to us, so that he could be part of our family. Why? So that he could redeem us from the curse of the law, so that he could purchase us and all that we are, and this whole world as his own possession. He's paid all our debts and set us free, and he has set us free so that we might do the same with others. So practice this forgiveness and grace. How much have you been forgiven? Right? You can't count that high. So forgive. Practice this in your life. Practice giving this relief, this rest, this Sabbath to everyone around you. Keep the light and life of Jesus central. Keep it burning in your heart. Keep it burning in your home. Keep worship central. Keep his word central. Tell the truth. Love your wife. Respect your husband. Obey your parents. Confess your sins. Forgive one another. Jesus has purchased us and the ends of the earth for his possession, and we belong to him, and he will keep us safe. Our God and Father, we praise you and thank you that you sent Jesus, and in him, the great jubilee. Father, thank you that in him all our debts have been paid, that we have been set free, Father, we pray that we would be a jubilee people, that we would be a people known for forgiveness, a people known for forgetting sins and crimes committed against us. Father, teach us to love like you love. And so, Father, we pray that your light and your life would be here in our midst and that it would fill our city and our nation because we ask for it in the mighty name of Jesus who taught us to pray, singing. Everyone who is baptized and not under... Lawful church discipline is warmly invited to join us here at the Lord's Supper. In the tabernacle in the holy place, there was bread, 12 loaves continually. The bread was called the bread of the presence, or in the King James, it uses the, the word showbread. Literally, the word for presence is the word that means face. The reason it's translated presence is because a very common Hebrew idiom uses the word face to mean in the presence of, literally before the face of, or toward the face of, or in front of. So when this bread is called the bread of the presence, uh, or show bread, that's what it's getting at. 
The whole idea is that God wanted Israel to know that he loved them. He wanted fellowship with them. There were 12 loaves sprinkled with frankincense. 12 loaves for the 12 tribes of Israel sprinkled with frankincense. What a picture of grace. God was promising and picturing for Israel a face-to-face fellowship full of sweetness, a sweet-smelling aroma. In this world and in this room, there are many hurts, there are many sins, and much harm has been done by sin and death. Many families broken, friendships strained or lost. But God has promised to reconcile all things in his son. All things includes the broken things in your life. This doesn't mean that God will always put back together in this world some things that we have broken, but it does mean that God is working all things together for good for those who love him. Sometimes the good he is working is beyond us. We can't see it. The women who mourned at the foot of the cross could not see the good that God was working. But Jesus is the resurrection and the life. He is the bread of life, the light of life. In him, there is no darkness, no death, no sorrow at all. And here at this table, in this bread and wine, he invites us to fellowship with him and with all his people. And you may have strains with some of those people, but your task is to look straight at the face of Jesus. See in this broken bread and poured wine, by faith, God's infinite wisdom and power and grace and love. The tangles of this world are nothing to him. And he has already written the check. He has already signed the paperwork in order to make all things right. Our job is to simply believe. So come in faith and welcome to Jesus Christ. In the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and gave thanks. So let's give thanks together. Our God and Father, we praise you and thank you for Jesus. We thank you that on the cross... He cried out, it is finished. And in that cry, it really was accomplished. It was all done. The power of sin, death, and Satan is broken forever. And so, Father, we rejoice in you, knowing that you are in the process of putting everything back together again, beginning with us. And so we praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. And amen. You are the people of God. And what God has always proclaimed to his people, that he wants fellowship with you, that you are his people, and what he proclaimed in the tabernacle there, even with the bread of the presence and the light that shone, God was proclaiming to them, this is, this is the kind of fellowship I want, my face shining with your face, face-to-face fellowship, face-to-face joy. And so as you go, whatever it is that you face this week, you go with God, the Father, beaming over you, rejoicing over you. He has released you from your sins so that you might be released to go release others. You've been forgiven, so that you might forgive. So go now with his blessing upon you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his counts upon you and grant you his peace. And amen.